Can you good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon once again, everyone. I'm so happy to have you here. The few housekeeping items, it will not take us the whole hour to go over these slides, but I have set quite a bit of time for um, questions. Um, we do have question session at the end, um, but you can stop me anytime that you have a question for me. So this webinar is focused on resources and some miscellaneous information about the fixed amount grants and also the monitoring process. I know we have some of our older programs, program managers here, so they are familiar with the monitoring process, but take it as a refresher. All right, let's go to the slide number three. Oh, here's, okay, I'm sorry. Here's my email address on the slide number two and my phone number if you need to reach out to me for anything. Um, Latifah's uh, phone number and email address is also here. So let's do this. So I think I will request Candace is writing slides for me. So thank you, Candace. If you can click on the first link, and that is the uh, attachment for the terms and conditions that are attached to your contract. I would highly recommend um, reading the very first item on it. That is the changes from previous year's grants, terms, and conditions. Um, Candace, if you can click on that, you will see that there are uh, quite a few changes there. So there is a um, change. We'll, we'll go to, I think, each section here. There's a, there's, okay, so there's a great one, teleservice, teleservice, uh, um, um, what do you call the clause? They have updated that. They have updated the language and it's pretty extensive actually. So let's click on to, or the first one. I didn't go over. I'm sorry. I didn't go over the first one because they have just updated the link to NSCHC, but let's go to the teleservice. I'm sorry, Ken. Let's, let's go to the teleservice one. The teleservice section, this is the training, but I think I'm saying this, the teleservice one. The very first item, which is the changes from previous years. Yeah, so click, can you go to this section where it says that the teleservice? Is it section 17? It is not section 17, it's 5E. 5E, gotcha. Mm -hmm. It's definitely 5E. See? Yes, yes. So as you will see, if you compare the two, um, you know, from previous years, which is 2023 versus this 2024, there has been extensive changes to that. If you're still planning to use the tally service for anything, then you need to look at that. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. And then, then we will, this is the tally service that they have updated. And the next one, uh, Candice, if we can go to that again, then it's 5H, which is the timekeeping requirements when AmeriCorps members engage in other federal uh, grant activities. Sometimes AmeriCorps members work on, on more than one grant. So they just want to make sure that that you count their time correctly, not kind of double dip in it. So they have updated that one as well. Um, and then let's see, um, they have added quite a bit, quite a bit of trainings this year um, where they have, uh, we can go to 17 right quick. I'll come back to the uh, encouragement one, but let's go to the training, which is 17. Candace, I'm sorry, go to the 17. Yeah, this one. So they, this is a new training that they have added fraud awareness training for AmeriCorps grantees. It's similar to the one that you have been doing for NSCHC, which is the, the which is the course that you go to Litmus. This is the link here that you can go to litmus.com and create your user word and pa password, user ID and password and then complete this training. This is again, it's annually, and then you need to do that. It, yeah, this is litmus, where it's username and um, password that you have to create to complete this training. Um, so it's similar to the NSCHC, like I said, and you should, at least, you must actually, you must complete this training and at least one staff member. I would highly recommend getting two people, 
that person who has completed leave, then, you know, then you may not know what this is all about. So maybe two people, but at least one. The requirement is just one person, minimum one person, one staff person to fulfill this requirement on behalf of the program. So, so this is fraud awareness. And there's also a great one, developing policies and procedures, state and national grantees. It's, it's a great, great, I have taken this course uh, or training. It's, it's a great one and it's also a requirement. So they have added these two trainings this year. Um, they have also added 5H. We have already gone by which let's see number eight. Yeah, scroll. Yeah, added encouragement to provide additional benefits to members. So they have added some more benefits to members. And um basically just to attract more hardcore <laughs> members. So so look at that, um, this this clause and um and get yourself familiarized with what the additional benefits they have added. I think they're saying that if, just briefly, if they, the, the, if any member is on a leave and then you wanna put them on a leave rather than suspending them, you can still pay them leaving allowance, but there are some restrictions on that. So read about that. I think um, it, it's, it's a great benefit though. So I think uh, it's a pretty extensive terms and conditions. So I'm not gonna go with every single one uh, of the um, clauses, but um, but you need to be aware of these. Okay, we are gonna go to the next resource, which is a fixed amount grant financial and administrative process guide. It's a great guide for the fixed amount grantees. It's also 22 pages and it has uh, FAQs uh, starting from page 13 through all the way through 22. It talks about uh, how to draw funds, how to calculate um, the reimbursement from us based on the number of hours that they serve. You can see that it has FAQs, just a great, great, great information. Um, it's still updated, even though it says that it was, it was developed, I think in 2020 or something like that, but it's still updated and a great resource to have and use to manage your grant. All right. Um, I think we're going to go to the third one. This is the member service agreement template. So this has all the required components. Um, of course, it's for reference only because a lot of programs, they have their own design. They add some, you know, additional requirements to the member service agreement. But I just wanted to put it out there for you to just have it and look at it that and see what are actually required components. This is also part of the new training that you will take developing policies and procedures. Um, but I just wanted to put a, a separate link for that too, because it's very, very important. So many findings about this MSAs. So, so that's that. Um, and your approved contract and budget. That's, that's the one that you will have your cost per MSY amount per member so and there are a lot of contract clauses that are state clauses that you need to be aware of so that's another resource that you need to to keep in mind when you um, when you manage your grant last but not the least the internal policies and procedures that's the reason they have developed they have actually they are acquiring um, programs to complete that training because it's just very important when you develop these policies and procedures, you avoid so many common mistakes. Uh, so, so develop these policies and follow these policies when you manage this grant. Um, the last thing on this uh, slide is that responsibility. Responsibility of managing this grant falls on you. We are here. We are here to support you to um, answer any questions you may have, um, help you in any way we can, but but I just want to stress it enough that it's your responsibility to be aware of these terms and conditions. I know they are very extensive. I know they are very detailed, but if you have decided to take up on this award, you need to make sure you know that it terms and requirements, terms and conditions of this grant. So 
we can go to the second one. I just threw this out in there because we do have some of our programs who have already managed, who are already managing this grant. So I just wanted to see if, you know, if you can tell me or think of any examples of internal policies that you would create or have created to manage this grant. You can put that in the chat box. I'll give you a couple of minutes um, just, just to think about it and just, just briefly, just three, four words about um, you have created policies. Anyone else? All right, think about that, that though. Think about the policies that you would create to manage your grant. I have on the next slide, uh, Candace, I have actually provided some examples. Um, have a written policy. These are just examples. There are tons and tons of policies that you can create to streamline. Um, things, but uh, about how to manage the calculations and drawdown. Because I do see issues here too when I uh, monitor this grant. Non-discrimination policy is pretty hot topic. Um, just make sure that you have the policy, you include all the components because sometimes they leave some, some things uh, from that. Just make sure it's just complete. Um, have a policy and procedure in place regarding reasonable accommodation for um, disabled people, for disabled members and staff, um, make sure they um, have accessibility, have a policy and procedure in place for uh, LEP, uh, limited English proficiency, uh, have a process for Identifying miracle program, very important one. Logos, websites, service gears, social media. Yes, so these are some of the policy that I just wanted to include, but like I said, there are so many. And when you take that class, you will know that there are tons and tons of policies that they will go over with you. All right, let's see, go to the next one. Okay, advantages and disadvantages of fixed amount grants. What are the advantages? No match, no budget, and no financial reporting. Great advantages, but disadvantages are where you will only get reimbursed based on the numbers of hours members serve. If you have a member who leaves early and doesn't complete the minimum required um, service hours, then you will not get the full cost for MSY for that member. And that is a, a major drawback. Um, new applicants may not apply for fixed amount grants. It used the word may, but you know, so new applicants may not be eligible for fixed amount grants. But it's a great one if you can come up with the, you know, of course, because you only get uh, funds per cost, cost per MSY, so you don't get enough from us. So you will have to come up with funds to manage the grant if you think you have significant support um, some other way than it may be for you. But if it's not, it may not be for you. So, so these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of fixed amount grants. Let's go to the next one. 
Okay, I think Latifa will take over that. Yes. Um, hey, folks. So what requirements still apply under fixed amount grants? We are going to review a guide really quickly. Um, this link is in the chat. It would be the second link if you want to follow along on your screen. And we'll go down to page 14 uh, to question number four. I think it was. Yes. And can we make that a little bit bigger, Candace? I'm going to just read this off. I think a lot of us uh, should be familiar with this as Neelam shared. Like, this is a really helpful document. Um, as you can see, like, a lot of this is from 2018, or this is from 2018, and a lot of it still applies, or it all still applies, uh, with some uh, changes, which we can talk about a little bit later. But uh, question number four, what requirements still f apply under fixed amount grants? The answer is, and I will literally read, except for the requirements specifically, Attributable, attributable to allowable costs and application and financial reporting paperwork. All other requirements are still going to apply to this fixed amount grant. Um, so grantees should refer to these regulations, to the CFR regulations, to the uniform guidance, um, to your grants and terms conditions like the LIM reference. Those are very important. They all describe all the requirements that come with uh, your specific grant, um, but are not limited to you. Um, and these are the following. So a full-time AmeriCorps member is going to receive that living allowance and they're offered health coverage. Members meet eligibility and they have that criminal history check standards. Um, the programs need to implement member time keeping systems. I have a few programs on here. We have a few programs on here that have uh, really, I would call best practice um, member time keeping systems um, to track your member service hours. <laughs> Um, some of you I know use America Learns, others Encore, and some of you have created your own or using another system. Maybe throw in some of those into the chat. What are folks using currently to manage their members' time? I'd love to see a couple of those in the chat. Um, performance measures, those are reported into programmatic performance oversight systems. You know that you have your uh, recently actually just submitted a progress report um, and included those performance measures. And then a few other things, programs contribute significantly, significant uh, non-CNCS funds, so that's your match so that you can actually operate uh, the program, though that there is no match for, uh, or there's no required match for fixed programs. Um, grantees submit quarterly financial reports, same as both fixed and cost reimbursement, both have to submit those FSRs and then also comply with the uniform guidance that was referenced earlier. Um, including those single audit requirements and throwing in a quick commercial break, we will be reaching out to everyone soon. At least programs who have a 630 deadline or 630 uh, fiscal year end um, to touch base on some audit items. Um, and then back to your presentation. So grantees also must comply with the program income use and earning requirements. So let's, let's get a little. <laughs> That's what I just made up a word. Um, but for a quick quiz, maybe literally someone just throw into the chat one of the things that uh, we just kind of went over. What requirements still apply under a fixed amount grant? And maybe you can even think of something that wasn't listed. We'll give it like two minutes. Maybe some folks want to come off mute or go into the chat. Again, this is what requirements still apply under the um, fixed amount grants. And I guess the full question would be versus the cost reimbursement. So uh, you may not be familiar with that. So just like try to remember what we just went over and then maybe someone can throw that into the chat. I know we have a couple of folks on here who've been uh, with a fixed grant uh, for at least the last two cycles. We've got some familiar people on here that are familiar with fixed amount grants. Thank you, Tanya Bridges. So shared requirements, exactly that timekeeping 
branding compliance requirement recruitment policies um, and really, really for six amount grants, we're talking timekeeping. That's the distinction there. Thank you, Tana. Um, we'll go ahead and go to another set of slides. All right, so we're going to talk about member living allowance. That is what I will cover um, right now. And this is the big thing when it comes to a fixed amount grant, right? The member living allowance. I am now realizing that potentially I could, I could use support, Candace. Um, are you still there? I am. Could you actually uh, navigate the slides for me? I just sent you a separate, um, a separate slide deck. Okay. And I'm realizing my notes are like, completely separate and, and you all have heard me say this before folks on these calls I still do not have a second screen I, it takes me forever <laughs> yeah which is really not great but um do we have any new programs on the call because to go back to what Neelam referenced earlier um we do encourage and I think uh, mostly have all new programs uh submit um cost reimbursement or, or you know, fall underneath the cost reimbursement grant period. So do we have any new programs on the call right now? It's uh, not well, kicking you off. We're a new planning grant. Mm. Awesome, yeah. So this would not apply to you today, um, but it this I think is definitely helpful to participate in as mm -hmm. many <laughs> core uh, related uh, webinars as possible. Uh, for the future, so you won't right. have this kind of grant budget um, for this year, or potentially the following year. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Can we also get uh, folks to throw in the chat how um, many years you have had a fixed grant? Maybe you know this. Maybe you don't. I know that uh, we have. I think a couple of new staff on here, but how many years has Bridges had a fixed grant uh, relay? Do you all know? Oh, am I alive? Let's stop counting. <laughs> <laughs> a long time, a long time. I okay. Yeah, I, I, I want to say like we switched around 2017. We've been mm. in a fixed grant for a while, like 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 several three year grants, like at least yeah for the last six years definitely. Yeah, okay. We definitely have several veterans, and thank you, Tanya, on here. Uh, Andrew threw in uh, at least three years, and then Megan also threw in a couple. Uh, Crystal uh, for relay six plus years, and OMG, you have one Judith quarterly that is uh, about ten years. That's awesome. So you all are deeply in the know on um, these different items. Uh, we'll quickly run through. I think what I usually like to lean into is uh, what you all need to hear, uh, what uh, questions are important for you to uh, get clarification on, et cetera, et cetera. But let's go ahead and dive in. Um, thank you, Candace. I appreciate it. Uh, Candace did ask me in advance if I needed support, and I quickly told her no, and here we are needing the advance. Okay, so recipients should pay the living allowance in regular increments. Um, we're going to talk about uh, payments, how they should be steady and consistent increments, um, looking at weekly or biweekly. Any increase should like only reflect actual uh, increased living expenses such as higher costs of food or housing or transportation as listed on the screen. We can come over to that next slide talking about payment stability. Um, so next, what's kind of important is obviously we know this, but to maintain that payment stability, payments should absolutely not um, ever be um, based on a member's uh, or it shouldn't change based on the member's hours served in any given period. And crucially, payments must stop when a member's service ends. I know that um, I've had to chat with a couple of folks, 
not in a negative way, but just uh, throughout uh, going through uh, terminating someone, um, ending their service and figuring out uh, the different ends of that. And one of that includes stopping payments post haste. We'll go over to that next slide, talking about payments during a suspension. Um, this is looking at members who are suspended. Um, and obviously, again, not receiving that living allowance. So uh, those payments should be paused. Um, they should not receive payments during a suspension period. And going to uh, slide five, or not slide five, this next slide. Um, so as you can see on the screen, if a member completes all the required hours and they finish their term early, uh, you cannot give them a lump sum payment. Uh, payments absolutely must continue to flow uh, like the water and a regular schedule. Um, yep, no lump sums. And then to this next slide, thank you, Candace. Oh, my screen just went blank, but I know that you all are still here because this happens to me all the time. Um, so for members who join um, after the program start date, they begin their regular payments from their start date, and then those do not increase. They absolutely cannot increase that incremental uh, payment or, again, provide a lump sum to cover any missed payments. And I think this is the last one. Um, we'll go to this next slide. <clears throat> Lastly, if a member is going to extend their term of service, um, no additional living allowance is paid beyond what is stipulated in your contract. So payments need to stop at the end of the originally agreed term, at least based on your contract with Volunteer Tennessee and using those federal dollars, uh, which you all, um, what funding you put into that, that would be obviously different. Okay, so to sum it up, Guys, it's just crucial to maintain consistent, fair payment practices, which all of the fabulous ones here definitely do. Um, regular increments, uh, stopping payments at the end of a service term, and kind of ensuring that no additional allowances for extensions, um, those are going to be key points to remember. And that is it. Uh, thanks for your attention. And now, if you have any questions for me specifically uh, on member enrollment practices and um, underneath your fixed grant and want to discuss any concerns you might have. This could be the time. I don't know. Actually, maybe I'm speaking incorrectly and Neil, we're saving that for later. Hmm. All right. Any questions? We're going to have question sessions, like I said um, in the beginning. I'm just going to go over the monitoring process because we have kind of 15 minutes left um, that we had for this webinar. So a quick Monitoring process, our, like I said, our older programs, they are aware of the monitoring process. There's never an unannounced visit. I always give them enough time to pull the information um, that I need. But why is monitoring done? Uh, monitoring is done for, um, for a few reasons. We do that because we do have a state policy, policy 2013-007 that requires us to, to actually monitor all, all of our uh, subrecipients. It's also required by national standards and it's also required by uh, federal provisions. Um, so that's why we do the monitoring, not that we love doing monitoring, but we, we do, but but not just only because of that. We do have other requirements, and that's why we do the monitoring. How are the contracts selected to be monitored? Um, uh, Latifa and um, the other program manager that she has, they and Jim, they actually do the risk-based approach that Latifa will go over quickly, how they select, because I'm not involved in selecting the contracts to be monitored due to the segregation of duties. So Latifa, if you can quickly just go over that, that would be great. Um, it's actually pretty simple for monitoring process. Uh, everyone has to be monitored in some form within three years. Um, and so we go based off of that timeline. Have you been monitored in three years? And then also, are you high risk? Uh, what we identify as high risk, it, it fluctuates, but really and truly new programs, we're always going to basically say that's high risk. Um, and then if you have had uh, several monitoring uh, findings, if you've if we've identified several findings prior to uh, in the last monitoring report, then that will also be a really good uh, 
indicative of us uh, having to do that um, monitoring report like a second go round within two, three years. Those are two really important ones. Uh, Candace, can we actually, yes, can we go to the slide, the first slide of the monitoring process? How often the, yes. So how frequently do the agencies get monitored? Like Latifa said, we will monitor it. I will monitor at least once in three years. So every every program will get monitored at least once in three years. Uh, but sometimes I have monitored programs more than once in three years, and that is also depending on the risks. And, and there can be so reasons that volunteer tenancy might think that, hey, you know, we need to monitor these programs because they are not submitting the information that we require them to submit in a timely manner or not submitting at all, or a lot of staff turnover. It's just so many risks that they may evaluate during their day-to-day -day operations and they may request me to go ahead and get out and do this um, uh, monitoring review. So you can get monitored at least more than once in three years grant cycle, but at least once for sure. So the next slide, um, I'm going to skip that, but it's, it says that how often the programs get monitored is just once in three years for sure. So the monitoring process, process a little bit more, the monitoring business is, is scheduled at least 30 days in advance. So I give actually normally give more than 30 days in advance, but at least 30 days in advance, you will get an email from me saying that I, you know, you are on my monitoring list this year. And monitoring can be rescheduled, though I try my best to accommodate to your schedule if there are some things that you're busy doing, something like recruitment time is kind of hard for programs. So um, I try to accommodate to their needs. And same thing if something comes up on my end, then I try to reach out to you to reschedule. But of course, we do have deadlines. I need to issue all these reports by September 30th because the monitoring cycle runs from October 1st through September 30th. Um, but I will try my best to accommodate. Monitoring report, when is it issued? Is it is issued within 30 business days from the last day of the required information that I receive? Uh, typically, it doesn't take me 30 days to, to do so, but, uh, but that's the timeline. Uh, corrective action, corrective action um, is will be required if there are any observations and findings in the report. If there is none, then there's no corrective action. But if it's required, it will be within 15 business days from the date of the monitoring report and then it goes to Jim Snell. Of course, he will delegate it to our program managers and they, um, they are the ones who actually look at that. They may request me to look at some of the information because actually I am the one who looked at the information uh, about the findings, but they will help out and help you resolve these findings and observations. Volunteer tenancies, um, like Jim Snell, and then, like I said, the program officers, they will review and provide feedback and help you resolve this. All right, next one. When is corrective action due? Quickly, if somebody can put that in the chat. When is corrective action due? No one is willing to do that? Okay, so 15 business days. 15 business days from the last day of the monitoring Oops, I see that though. Great, that's awesome. Awesome, Tim. that's great. Uh, monitoring review, what does this involve? It involves a review of these items, but not limited to, of course, there may be some information that, um, that, that I will need to review and it becomes necessary for me to request more information, but typically it's member files and, um, if there's any partial award, then I'll request a partial award documentation, some eligibility documentation. Member timesheets, very, very important here for the fixed amount grants because that's how you get reimbursed. National service criminal history checks, internal policies and procedures that I mentioned in my first slide. Audit report that Latifa mentioned that we will reach out to you and then we'll get that audit report uh, process going. Supporting, document, supporting documentation for performance, performance measures. Because this is fixed amount grant and performance measures are of high importance. They get scrutinized um, quite a bit. 
because um, that's why you are getting funding, funding cost per MSY that you have the targets and you meet those targets and you have the supporting documentation to show what you have reported in your final progress report. All right, let's go to the next one, Candice, please. OK, so this is the one that uh, this is the current monitoring cycle. Of course, I'm still not done. Like I told you, it's by September 30th, I have to issue all the reports. But these findings that I have noted, these are common findings. These are not all of the findings. Member service agreements. Uh, this is a very, very common finding where um, the information that needs to be correct is not correct because they have used the previous template or they haven't changed this education award amount that changes from year to year. Uh, civil rights requirements are very, very important. So all these core required components that are not included for a lot of programs. Performance goals, I just went over that. They, they just are not meeting their performance goals that they say that they would. The member service star date in the member service agreement must match with the star date in the portal. So the portal shows a different star date and the MSA shows a different one. So they need to match the requirements as it needs to match. A non-compliant national service criminal history checks. That's another one that's uh, this allows big one. <laughs> so make sure that you are doing your national criminal history checks um, correctly. Next slide, please. Should star date per member service agreement match with the service star date in the AmeriCorps portal? Yes or no? Somebody wants to put in there? Yes, 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 yes. Great, great. Should member service agreements include member position descriptions or no? Yes or no? MSA must include member position description, yes. Great. All right. Next one. How can what you should do? What are the preventive actions? Understanding the contract scope of services, the performance measures. You don't have to have like tons of performance measures because I have seen they have four or five and they're just kind of don't know which one to, to do. It's OK to have one or two and then then, you know, meet your targets, please. Uh, understand America terms and conditions. Understanding is your responsibility, like I, I stated earlier, and ask questions. We are here for you. Latifa, the other program manager, I'm here to help you. Ask as many as questions you want to, and we will help you. We'll answer any questions. If we don't know, we will get the answers for you. But please do ask questions, because if you don't, then we don't know what you need help with. So I, I really, I don't know how much I need to stress that, but but it's very important that you ask questions. Okay, yeah. let's see. I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I ask a question real quick? And if, we, um, if, I, if I need to email you, we can do that too. But um, regarding the matching of member service agreements date to the um, AmeriCorps portal, um, and so we have found historically that when we submit the... Um, AmeriCorps members in the portal, it might take a few days for them to actually be enrolled. And so should the, so if we're uh, an August 1st start date, should the member service agreement say on or after August 1st? It should match. It should, if you, if you are going to say, okay, if the enrollment date, for example, in the portal is August 2nd, August 1st, it okay. should say exactly what it is. You can okay, ask so me more questions about that in the email if you would like, but but the requirement says that they should agree. It shouldn't be, it will fall within, like it will fall from August through nine. It, it should match exactly the date that the portal says. Okay, so, so with that, I guess the member service agreement should be signed after they've been enrolled. Before they start their service. So if they have been enrolled, okay. for example, August 1st, the, the member service agreement must be signed before August 1st. Okay. Okay. But it will have the like... effective date of August 1st. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. If you have more, more, I mean, 
you want more information or that, and you have more questions, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer those. Consequences of findings are great because there will be cost disallowance for not conducting these checks. Or not will be disallowed. May affect the future finding if correct proper corrective action is not taken in a timely manner. So, you know, it like Latifa said, they look at the findings and if you have not corrected them and it's kind of, you know, repeated findings, then it may affect your future finding. Next one, please, Candice. Questions, we're here. I know it's kind of, we don't have much time, but left, uh, but, um, Five more minutes, we're here. Or if you have more questions, uh, you can always email us. Um, but is that okay, Latifa? If we can do five more minutes for. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, don't let my, my chat stop folks from asking questions, but I do want to give a commercial break while folks are thinking. Again, I know I keep saying this, but I want to keep uh, reiterating every time I get the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, we are moving to a different system for um, submitting invoices. That uh, process will be shared as soon as possible, uh, but I want to make sure that that's on your radar. Um, the hope is this will simplify it for everyone. So uh, don't be on the lookout for anything uh, that will change significantly, uh, at least increase or decrease your capacity. I just want to throw that in there. Thanks, Crystal. See ya.